live from KSAT 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. Did the Bear County District Attorney violate campaign finance laws through his relationship with the Wren Collective? That's the criminal justice reform group whose connection with the DA's office we have been investigating for weeks now. We took our questions to an attorney with expertise in ethics and campaign laws. Erica Hernandez asked if the DA's failure to disclose his work with the Wren Collective is a violation of campaign finance rules. We've been examining more than 200 pages of text messages between the Bear County District Attorney's Office and the Austin-based Wren Collective. Their discussions about policy, court cases, public messaging, and mentions of campaign. In one message, Wren Collective founder Jessica Brand tells Joe Gonzalez, just to clarify, I can talk campaign with you, but my team can only talk policy and comms. I can do either just as long as they don't happen at the same time. That's a, a, a smart a smart move to not have uh, official and campaign communications uh, crossover. But yeah, it does sound like there is campaign communication going on. Andrew Cates is a political attorney here in Texas with years of experience helping elected officials and candidates navigate what they can and can't do while in office or running for office. We asked Cates whether Joe Gonzalez should have disclosed campaign help from the Wren Collective on campaign finance reports. There is no record of that. It depends on what they're providing to him as a as a candidate and not yeah. just as an elected official. Um, if it is something that, like I said, he would otherwise need to pay for, then I would say it, it could likely be a, a, an in-kind. An in-kind contribution is something a candidate or official would normally need to pay for, but is given to them for free, which they still must disclose. Another conversation he's asking as he's about to do a press conference or a speech asking, do I reference to my reelection in November or should I stay away from party politics and avoid mentioning Republicans like the governor? And she does advise him. I mean, yeah, that, that sounds like campaign advice. At one point in these messages, Gonzalez asked that the conversations be moved to his personal email. We have requested copies of those messages, too. Even if the lines have not been crossed, Kate says he would have advised the DA's office to get county approval to work with the Wren Collective. You guys have the text messages. It, it doesn't look great. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if there is... Um, if there's not a contract out there anywhere, um, then that's questionable. So there is no contract between the DA's office and the Wren Collective. Our team has been trying to reach Bear County Judge Peter Sakai to ask about this, but he hasn't been available. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. Number of car thefts skyrocketed in San Antonio last year, helped along by social media exposing security weaknesses on certain car models. But carjackings were actually down in the city. San Antonio police stats show carjackings, which are often done at gunpoint, already much less common than car thefts. Car thefts were up by thousands last year, while, ca while carjackings rather dropped by the dozens. But it doesn't mean that they aren't an issue. Anthony Ross found out that earlier this month when he was carjacked at a gas station. And so I said, uh, what's that? Because he was pointing something at my midsection. Mm -hmm. I said, is that a gun? He said, yeah. So I went in my pocket and gave him my car keys. San Antonio police stats also show more carjackings in January of this year compared to the months of January in both 2022 and 2023. So what can we do to protect ourselves? Well, here are just a few safety tips from the Texas A&M University San Antonio Police Department to help prevent you from being a victim of a carjacking. Always be aware of your surroundings. When you're walking up to your car, make sure to have your keys in your hand. Don't leave your car unlocked or running when you get out of it and make sure to park in well lit areas. Tonight we are learning more about a teenager shot and killed on the northeast side. San Antonio police have arrested someone in that case. We first told you about this yesterday on the news at 530. An arrest affidavit states that 18 year old Octavius Tomrian Galloway shot and killed the 17 year old at an apartment complex on Ben Zingelman. That's not far from I-35 and Seguin Road. Investigators say a witness had video of the shooting that showed several cars leaving the area. 
Police later stopped one of those cars and they say Galloway was inside. He's now been charged with murder. The medical examiner's office has not released the name of the victim. A loss at Brandeis. Tonight we're learning an instructional assistant at Brandeis High School has died after being injured by a student last week. That's according to Northside ISD. Alfred Jimenez, also known as Mr. Fred, was injured the morning of February 7th after falling to the ground while trying to redirect a student who has a severe learning and emotional disability. Mr. Fred got a head injury. He sadly passed away because of it. Northside ISD, the police department there, are now investigating. News around Texas now. The search continues for 11 year old Audrey Cunningham. The girl from Livingston, Texas, was last seen Thursday morning after being dropped off at her bus stop. Today, law enforcement and firefighters searched the area around a river near Livingston. Crews also searched along the Lake Livingston Dam. Audrey's family says they are praying for her safe return. Everybody gives them some kind of privacy and let them deal with this. This is a tragic incident. And I know Audrey lo loved the, her grandmother, her father, her brother, and family. A person of interest in her disappearance is 42 year old Don Stephen McDougall. McDougall was arrested Friday by the Polk County Sheriff's Office on an unrelated assault charge. Jail records show that he has a lengthy criminal history, including felonies for crimes against children. Let's go to the Dallas area now and one person in custody after firing a gun on a school campus there today. It happened this morning at the Pioneer Technology and Arts Academy in Mesquite. Local police say a person went into the school with a firearm. When officers got to the school, they tried to negotiate with that suspect. Soon after, there was an exchange of gunfire between the suspect and officers. That suspect shot by police taken to a nearby hospital. Luckily, no students or officers were injured in all of this. A couple of things we want to remind you about before voting in the Texas primary gets underway. Early voting for the primary starts tomorrow. It will run until March 1st. This Friday is the deadline to apply for a mail-in ballot, and then Election Day is on March 5th. We have more information on voting locations and a sample ballot you can look at right now on KSAT.com. And there are a lot of interesting races up there. And coming up in our next half hour, He's got the backing of the governor, Republican candidate for District 121 State Representative Mark LaHood will join us live on our KSAT Q&A. LaHood campaigning for the Republican nomination against incumbent Steve Allison and the other challenger, Michael Champion. We're digging deeper into this race. You can catch our live interview with LaHood coming up tonight at 630. We are now 49 days away from the total solar eclipse. For most of us, it will be just really cool to see. But for scientists, it's a rare opportunity to study more about the sun. Max Massey spoke with the Southwest Research Institute lead on airborne and ground eclipse missions about what he hopes to learn during this day. This is a cosmic phenomenon that is a unique thing to experience, and I think everyone should have that chance. Dr. Amir Caspi is like so many of you out there, excited for April 8th solar eclipse. I think something like 100 million people are in the path of totality or will be driving to the path of totality. Dr. Caspi is helping coordinate two huge projects. The first involves community members from across the country. Using 35 of these telescope stations run by community participants whom we give the equipment to and training to, and they are observing all the way along the eclipse path from Eagle Pass, Texas, up to Holton, Maine, to observe the eclipse in a bucket brigade uh, as it passes over every one of those stations in turn. And the second, two jets flying out of Houston. Flying NASA's WB-57 jets at altitudes up to 50,000 feet to observe with nose-mounted telescopes. The idea finally able to learn more about the sun. One of the long-standing questions of the solar corona is why is it so hot? It's actually millions of degrees and the solar surface is only a few thousand degrees. The sun's corona is actually the outermost part of the sun's atmosphere. The corona is usually hidden by the bright light of the sun's surface. And you can finally see that solar corona. You can see it with your eyes. You can see it with instruments. Now, as preparations begin the final phase, the hope is just that all of the instruments cooperate accordingly. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. Yeah, that's the biggest part. You need all the equipment to work. Oh, my gosh. Yes. yes. Always, right? And I do need, do need to chime in. Mm -hmm. Of course, lightning is actually five times hotter than the surface of the sun. Wow. Yes.
factoid. 50,000 degrees. Yep. All right, let's take a look at our live cam here. 66 out there at the moment. 43 to, for the dew point. Those numbers are going to meet in the 40s later on tonight. That's going to give us a saturated air and areas of fog. So clear skies, minimal breeze, patchy fog developing, especially along and east of I-35 after midnight. Here's our future cast for visibility. And notice by 2 a.m., the fog's starting to creep in from the east. And most of us along and east of I-35 will be dealing with it for the morning commute and all the way through about 10 a.m. Then it lifts and it's out of here. We've got a sunny and dry stretch. I'll tell you why it's going to be dry, how warm it's going to get, and how many other foggy mornings we'll have in just a bit. Thank you, Adam. We'll check out traffic right now. We're going to go to I-10 at Brazos, and we actually showed you this at 5 o'clock. They have the exit block there. I'm guessing it's just construction. It looks like there's some construction equipment out there. Uh, no official notification from tech stop, but this is I-10 at Brazos. You can see not a lot of traffic on the upper or lower deck here, but this exit is closed. Still ahead on the news at 6, spring break coming up fast, and that might mean time around pools or lakes. After the break, how one program is teaching kids to be safe in and around the water. I'm Stefania Jimenez, and here's what we're working on for you tonight on The Night Beat. Many of our kids are still feeling the setbacks as a result of the isolation from the coronavirus pandemic. And tonight on The Night Beat, we're going to show you why the experts are seeing more teens with social anxiety, and also they're going to tell us how we can help them. Plus, doctors sounding the alarm about diabetes and amputations. More than 280,000 people in Bear County have diabetes, and doctors are noticing that more patients are getting amputations because of complications with diabetes. Tonight on the Night Beat, the simple changes that you can make to save your limbs. We'll see you for those stories and a lot more tonight on the Night Beat. Thanks, Stephanie. As spring break gets closer, some kids will probably find themselves in or around the water. So there's a local program giving kids the skills and knowledge they need to stay safe. And Tiffany Wertz shows us how this program is helping hundreds of kids in San Antonio build confidence in the water. After a few days of learning about water safety, five-year-old Matias Casas and his classmates are ready to hit the pool. Ready, he has been so excited to have this experience. Yesenia Casas is also excited for her son Matias to learn from swimming instructors at Elmer Swim School Alamo Ranch. Once waivers are all checked in, we kind of line them up on the side. The students from Pre-K for SA are divided into different groups. And then their session begins. They do go underwater a few seconds. We want the kids to know what it feels like to be underwater. In case of an emergency, how your body's going to feel and how it will react. Ready? These Thank private you. lessons are made possible through a partnership with the nonprofit Miss Tristan Foundation. Well, Miss Tristan Foundation, um, it was founded by Mr. Joe Bird back in 2016. Unfortunately, his two-year-old daughter passed away in a drowning accident in his backyard pool. In her honor, um, Mr. Joe Bird started the foundation. Water safety education is offered to all children enrolled at Pre-K for SA free of charge. The curriculum is about two weeks, one in the classroom and one here. We take care of everything that we need to as far as the insurance, transportation. Uh, also along with that, we, have, uh, we, we supply the curriculum kits for our children and then also a backpack with some different information in there and then they leave with a life vest. Since the program started in 2022, over 4,000 children have taken the swim lessons. Over 100 children pass away from accidental d drowning. And if we can do anything to save and stop that, we want to do that. The program is now offered to about 2,000 pre-K for SA children for the fall and spring semesters across all four of the pre-K for SA centers. Drowning is preventable. It's 100% preventable. That's why we partner with these great um, locations and we try to give parents as many resources as we can. Yesenia encourages other parents to look into these swimming programs. There has to be some water safety. There's a lot of accidents that happened and um, kids do have to have knowledge of the importance of being in any any water. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Such an important project, and I'm glad to see partnering with people like the Emler 
mm -hmm. swim school. I think yeah. we inadvertently called it the Elmer swim school. It's the Emler. Emler, Emler swim, swim school. school. Yeah, very important. Let's talk about the forecast now. Outside today, can we get a duplicate <laughs> of that? Carbon copy. Yes. Rinse and repeat. Yes. And I think tomorrow we will, generally speaking, but get ready for some foggy mornings, not just tomorrow, but for a good chunk of this week. And then spring like afternoons ranging from the mid 70s to the lower 80s. But a dry and sunny stretch of weather. We could we could use the moisture. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like we're really going to get it. Let's go to the maps and take a look at our overall pattern. We don't have the activity here in Texas. It's all on the West Coast and even parts of the southeastern U.S., but a lot of moisture coming on shore again in California. You see this big pinwheel in the atmosphere, this big spin here that's pushing the moisture into California and the Intermountain West. I wish we could tap into that and have that move our way. Unfortunately, this is going to stay out of our area. And what we have in control right now is this big blue H. It's basically centered over Cabo San Lucas right now and just south of there. But this ridge bumps all the way up into Texas as it is going to be the primary driver of our weather the rest of this week and even into the weekend. Basically, the next seven to 10 days will be controlled by that upper level high that's going to be in place. And what that means for us is all the rain, the needed moisture is deflected around us. Actually, all, all the way up and down the plains from the Canadian border down to the Gulf Coast looking dry. The action is going to be the western U.S. and as you can see here, parts of the eastern U.S. Of course, we could use the moisture. We know that. But let's take a look at the proof here from the drought monitor. This is updated every Thursday and I don't anticipate improvements this coming Thursday. But you look, West Texas could use the rain, especially here in our neck of the woods and up into the hill country where we have this red area indicating the extreme drought and even the severe drought in western and northwestern Bear County. But you don't have to go that far to the east to see big improvements, not even considered abnormally dry east of Floresville, east of Seguin, actually in good shape when it comes to the rain. As for the temperature today, 35 earlier this morning, we felt felt the chill at sunrise this morning, just barely above freezing. But look at the afternoon, 67. It's the really dry air that gives us this big range in temperatures uh, that we have from the morning to the afternoon. And tomorrow's going to be similar. So plan for a jacket in the morning or a sweatshirt. And then by the afternoon, you can have short sleeves, no problem. 41 in Rio Medina tomorrow at sunrise, 46. I think downtown, but a little bit cooler in outline areas. Here's the case at 12, 12 hour forecast by 10 AM. That's when the fog starts to clear out and we'll be at 57 degrees warming up quickly because of this dry air 63 at noon and then a high temperature of 76 will hit that around 4 or 5 PM with a light southerly breeze tomorrow, making it to 78 in Pleasanton, 79 in Hondo up to 80 in Uvalde and notice our forecast the rest of this week. The fog being more widespread Wednesday morning and Thursday morning and fairly dense as well. Mornings will warm up a bit, but afternoons 70s to near 80 and not too humid. Ooh, sounds nice. Thank you, Adam. All right, it's a new league, but it's the same name. <laughs> San Antonio Brahma is getting ready to kick off and that little get together yesterday. Yeah, at the Alamo Dome. So they kick off the end of March, March 31st. Yeah. So yesterday, the Brahmas held a kickoff event at the Alamo Dome to get their fans hyped up and look at that. I mean, this gang, they're already ready to go, right? Go Brahmas. Plus, we uh, do you want a more competitive NBA All-Star game? I mean, 200 points plus, isn't that a lot, guys? We got it coming up. NBA All-Star 2024 has come and gone, and for Spurs rookie Victor Wimbanyama, he got a little taste of what All-Star Weekend is like. He played in the Rising Stars Challenge Friday night, and he had 11 points, 7 rebounds, and 2 blocks in 12 minutes playing for Team Pow. Then during All-Star Saturday night, Wimby hit the big stage for the skills competition, and once again, he put on a show. Wimby hopes to make the All-Star game itself from here on out. Now, 20-time NBA All-Star LeBron James says the sky's the limit for Victor Wimbanyama. I just think um, he's going to continue to get better and better and better and better the more games he play. Um, he has one of the greatest coaches in, in, in basketball history and Coach Pop, so he's going to learn the game and learn it the right way just by being around Pop. I mean, Pop is one of my favorite guys, So, uh, but the kid is special, and he's going to continue to get better and better. Um, you know, if he's doing this at 
what is he 19 right now? Um, he's just imagine what he's gonna look like at 21, 22, and like you know, so uh, special kid. West, like the East. All right, oh, East no, beat the West last night, 211 to 186, in the highest scoring game in NBA All Star game history. Some love it, others don't. Here's last night's MVP, Damian Lillard, on the topic. People who are fans of the game, you know they they love it. You know they enjoy being entertained and. I think it could be more competitive. Uh, you know, I think in our game right now, it's such a fast-paced game. We play a lot of games. Uh, the game has probably also had more injuries than it's ever had, you know, and trying to manage your body, trying to, you know, protect yourself and not get injured and take away from what you ultimately want to accomplish, I think is something that we prioritize. The 2025 NBA All-Star Game will be held at the Chase Center in San Francisco home of the Warriors. Yesterday at the Alamo Dome, the San Antonio Brahmas held a kickoff event to get their fans excited for the second season. New head coach Wade Phillips was taking pictures with fans along with Dallas Cowboys great and the United Football League's head of football operations, Daryl the Moose Johnston. Brahmas fans heard from them during a panel discussion where they talked about their hopes for the season and the direction of the new league. Case that told sports Nick Mantis was there and he has more. As you can see behind me, Brahma's fans are still lined up getting an opportunity to take a picture or get an autograph from brand new head coach Wade Phillips, as well as Dallas Cowboys legend Daryl Johnson. But one of the other things that was really exciting to see was two of the Brahma's newest players who have some South Texas ties. Real big blessing, man. I, um, last year when I played in this game against uh, San Antonio when I was in Orlando, I had like 100 people come out to watch me play. Um, so I think that same thing's gonna happen this uh, this time around. It's crazy how it feels full circle too because the same coach that recruited me out of high school from Baylor that offered me is my D-line coach here. So it's crazy, man. Uh, small world, man. Like I said, man, it's a blessing. You know, I love San Antonio. You know, I told my mom the other day, shoot, I live in San, San Antonio, man. It's, it's good people here. You know, they're real passionate, blue collar people. You know, the Brahmas, shoot, is a good representation of, of San Antonio. So I'm partially doing this thing for them, you know, for the city, you know. Uh, so, man, man, I'm just happy to be back home, really. Man, I'm happy to be back home. Well, we're only a couple of weeks away as those players hope to bring a little bit more excitement to spring football here in San Antonio, having that South Texas connection. From the Alamo Dome, Nick Mantis, KSAT 12 Sports. Thank you, Nick. And those fans are already crazy yeah, and pumped up. Some fired you see up Wade fans. Phillips, though? He was, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> yeah. Son of bum. Gotta love him. That's right. Thanks, Larry. <laughs> Coming up, he has the backing of Governor Abbott against the incumbent in the Alamo Heights area. Why? We're going to talk to Mark LaHood when we come back. Let's start now with the House District 121 race. We are joined now by Mark LaHood. He is a candidate in the Republican primary for that race. This is one that uh, you just saw ads for right before this segment. Yeah. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me on. Obviously, it's something, you know, top <laughs> of mind as we're entering early voting coming up um, tomorrow starts. So I want to start with asking you about one of the biggest issues that you have had in your ads of late, immigration, yeah. the border. You talked about wanting to make a change to create something along the lines of a border protection unit. Why do you think that's a solution? Well, I mean, quite frankly, because the federal government's not doing their job and we have to protect our home. Our border is just an extension of our home. And so uh, one of the reasons why I'm running is simply this, is that right now in the state house, there's a big group of Republicans that are voting against the governor, against the Senate, against the rest of us, and we haven't got anything meaningful. And so what I want to do is actually create legislation that actually has a bite to it, but then we have to fund it and support it. You, you are running against an incumbent, Steve Allison, who you would think he would get the backing of the governor, but I think because of what you said, he's voted against the governor on school vouchers. He is not getting the support of the governor. What's the biggest difference outside of vouchers between you and Steve Allison. Aside from school choice, the biggest issues are um, I'm unashamedly pro securing the border. Um, I want to make election uh, law and integrity uh, more more secure. I mean, the biggest issue is that Steve is the one that wrote the bill that reduced election fraud from a felony to a misdemeanor. Um, and quite honestly, Steve has been an advocate of DEI and woke policies. I'm not ashamed and I'm not shy in, in what my principles are and I've made that my forefront. And I think because of that, we now have the governor, we have the AG, we have Sid Miller, and we have Ted Cruz supporting us. But when you talk about uh, 
school choice, as you put it, or, yeah. or vouchers, as other people have put it. You are running in a district where uh, a lot of it is the Alamo Heights School District. And a lot of people are proud of that school district and don't want to see it weakened through school choice slash vouchers. How do you rectify that? I firmly believe it's all about messaging and propaganda. I believe that competition improves everything in business and in education because competition creates a better product, a better service, and a better price. In all the states that have passed it, teacher pay goes up, teacher uh, treatment goes up, and then most importantly, our, our students actually learn better. And so if Alamo Heights is a great school, people aren't gonna be leaving it. So that's not gonna be affected. I mean, it's, it's kind of a false argument because what's happening is parents want what's best for their kids. And I don't care whether you're Republican or Democrat. I've talked to hundreds of parents and they, all they want is what's best for their child, for their child to thrive. And this gives them that option. And I, that's a huge concern for those who have questions about the school voucher idea is taking public dollars away from a public education system that many would argue is already underfunded. So you don't feel like that would be a concern if a school voucher program were to exist in the state? I don't because if our schools are doing the job, people aren't gonna leave. I mean, the TEA just put out stats from last year where over 55% of our kids from kinder through senior year of high school are below where they should be in mathematics and over 35 or 37 percent are below where they should be in reading. Our schools are failing our children. You know, we're, we're focusing on, on, on ideology instead of just teaching them how to think for themselves and how to be successful. And so I believe, I full, wholeheartedly believe that what this is going to do is get schools back on track on focusing on being schools and not trying to raise something else. But it, you, you know what Alamo Heights is unique. I mean, you live there. You, you are familiar with it. I mean, they, there's a lot of pride in that school district being one of the state's best yeah. so i that the, it seems as if steve allison is is running against you with the fact of he's not for alamo heights public school and taking away funds from alamo heights public school yeah so the funds fall so my my suggestion or not my, I didn't create created but what i advocate is the funds follow the child so if the children are staying in alamo heights school district it's not being defunded that's what i'm saying it's a fake yeah. argument they're saying to try and get people emotionally blindsided Alamo Heights is a great school district. No one's leaving. The funds in Alamo Heights aren't going anywhere. But what we have to do is find out what's best and provide what's best for our children in all of our schools. And not just 121. I mean, if 121, those are our stats, what's in 117 or 116 or the rest of the state? We need, it, we need to invest in our kids. Let's talk about uh, an issue that at the Alamo Heights area is not alone in feeling, property tax. <laughs> yeah. Property taxes rising exponentially. Yeah. You have talked about how some of the state's effort to compress that, while you believe well-intentioned, hasn't worked. What's your suggestion? Well, I mean, it, it's worked, but it's a short-term solution. I mean, the, the problem is we need to figure out something that we're gonna be able to do long-term with our taxes. I mean, you know, the, the problem is this, right? Is that, what are the, what's the solution? We do what California does and do an income tax? I don't wanna do that. Um, but we need to figure out, one, where our tax money is going, but then we also have to keep our uh, appraisal district in check because it doesn't matter if they give us benefit on the front end. If, if, if the county's gonna come in and just jack up the prices, we're still paying. I mean, I, I didn't see any benefit this year. I didn't feel it. I wanna talk about just overall. You ran against now District Attorney Joe Gonzalez uh, a few years ago. Yeah. You've been a candidate before. I haven't seen Steve Allison come out against any of his other candidates, the, the, uh, the opponents, the way he has you do you have a feel as you're out campaigning how this election is going do you think because you're being attacked so vociferously by steve allison that this is a real race without a doubt i mean um we've hit close to ten thousand doors i've knocked on about a thousand doors myself uh and spoken with hundreds and hundreds of people and we're seeing um undeniable support um for our campaign for our messaging i mean you know I've run the campaign the same way I did for DA, right? Is uh, matter of fact, common sense, and I speak from the heart. And that's what people are resonating with. And I, I'm pretty confident that the support is there for us and we're gonna come out victorious on March 5th. Never easy to beat an incumbent. No, it's not, it's definitely a fight. But uh, I guess I have to pick hard battles. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right, election day, like you said, March 5th. Early voting starts tomorrow. Get out there and vote. We have a sample ballot, all the locations, all the things you need to know on our website. Mark, thanks so much for being Thank here. Thank you all so much. Thank you yeah. for your time. I know you're heading to a debate right after this, so we appreciate you fitting <laughs> Thank us. you. Y'all be safe. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. you too. We'll be right back.
The state of California in for round two of major storms in just weeks. As ABC's Zoreen Shaw reports, much of the state being battered again by heavy rain with flood alerts impacting tens of millions. In just the second time in weeks, California now pummeled by heavy rain. Flood alerts for nearly 40 million people, nearly one out of every eight Americans. Those storms unleashing up to four inches of rain with up to another four in coming hours, possibly leading to flash flooding and mudslides. Caution should be taken around flood control channels and in the crossings area. Recent landslides in Dana Point have many holding their breath during these storms as the homes now rest on the edge of this cliff. <sighs> Over in Santa Barbara, the main airport completely shutting down because of heavy flooding. Mm -hmm. Los Angeles is chasing its wettest February on record. Wow, that's, that's big. a mess. The state's biggest highway shut down in Klamath, California after a tree smashed down on a roadway, making traffic impossible. <laughs> A portion of Highway 128 also closed in Gearsville after a mudslide, and two people had to abandon their car over in Tamales, where flooding shut down this freeway. High winds, some up to 60 miles per hour, expected to rip through some areas. I'm afraid of the flooding for the homeless. I'm very concerned about that. Some people are fearing that being prepared may not be enough. We are prepared, uh, but I do still worry because the hills have not dried out from the last storm. And so, of course, every time there's a rain that's going to be heavy, we have to worry about mudslides. This rain is going to go through tomorrow, possibly day after, until the storm moves northeast. Zoreen Shah, ABC News, Los Angeles. Let's take a live look outside right now. Back here at home, sun setting after a fantastic day. We're going to get warmer, Adam. Yeah, we are going to get warmer. The mornings will be on the upswing temperature wise through the middle part of the week. If you think about it, Sunday morning, we officially hit freezing in San Antonio. And then this morning we were 35 for a low. You'll still want a jacket tomorrow. We well, we're 66 now, but temperature is quickly falling off. And by 6 a.m., we're down into the mid 40s and even lower 40s in outlying areas. Their eclipse factoid coming up along with the countdown. Tonight, San Antonio police have arrested a man in connection to the deadly shooting of a teenager. An arrest affidavit states that 18-year-old Octavius Tombrian Galloway shot and killed the 17-year-old at an apartment complex on Ben Ziegelman yesterday afternoon. Galloway is now being charged with murder. The medical examiner's office has not identified the victim. An instructional assistant at Brandeis High School has died after being injured by a student last week. Alfred Jimenez was injured the morning of February 7th after falling to the ground while trying to redirect a student who has a severe learning and emotional disability. Northside ISD police are now investigating. For the second time in two months, San Antonio firefighters have put out a fire at the same address. This latest case happened this morning at a home near Maiden Lane and Brandywine Street. The fire damaged at least two cars and a shed. No injuries reported. The first fire happened in December. Two people escaped, escaped the home during that first fire. It's still unclear if the two fires are connected. And that's your 60 second recap. All right, so a lot of people, it's weather like this is why people come here for spring break. I know. Spring break right an, around the corner, yeah, and I was an thinking about that today. today. I said, I don't want to go back to the station. <laughs> I would like to hang out outside. Yeah, it is nice. <laughs> it, it is very nice. Um, cool mornings, comfortable afternoons, just ideal weather, and, you know, we only get this for a short period of time, so we like to bask in it, and we do appreciate it. I want to get back to our countdown for the total solar eclipse 49 days away Monday, April 8th around 1 30 p.m. Our local time parts of San Antonio will be in the path of totality. That's mainly the far northwest side of town in Bear County. We've got more resources at KSAT.com. Here's a fact for you. Remember the total eclipse of 2017? We weren't in totality, but we had the partial eclipse. This time around, the moon is going to be even closer to Earth. So remember, the moon comes between Earth and sun, but this time it's going to be closer. That's going to lengthen the amount of time we're in totality, and also it widens the path of totality a bit. So overall, just a better total solar eclipse on the way. And we're going to have totality in parts of the hill country for four minutes or even a little bit more than that. All right, let's talk about our fog. Let's, <laughs> let's hope we don't have any clouds or fog April 8th. Trust me, I'm just... It's it's on my mind a lot, but 
climatologically speaking, we have uh, the the less the least amount of cloud cover than anywhere else along the path of totality in the U.S. Climatologically speaking, tomorrow morning we'll have the low stratus cloud at the ground fog and visibility is down to under a mile, especially along and east of I-35. Then by 11 a.m. It's all out of here and we'll actually have a decent amount of sunshine most of the day tomorrow, especially for the midday and afternoon. Notice the morning temperature trend up and down, up and down. 40s tomorrow morning, but then 60 degrees on Thursday morning, only to fall back again to have a bit of a chill in the air by this upcoming weekend at 47 degrees Saturday morning. So a little bit of a roller coaster ride for the morning temperatures. Afternoons, though, on cruise control, 70s to one instance lower 80s. But tomorrow morning, 41 Rio Medina in Comfort, 43 Bulverde, 46 downtown, 43 Stinson and Port SA. By the afternoon, we're well into the 70s. We'll be well into the 70s, even pushing 80 in a few locations, especially along the Rio Grande. And notice the high temperature trend, 70s to low 80s on Thursday. That's about it, but beautiful conditions and above average for this time of year. The activity is all on the West Coast right now. That's a you saw the, the story from ABC Network, the national uh, story out of California with more heavy rain moving in and higher elevation snow. We've got the Big Blue H over the southern Baja Peninsula and western Mexico that's poking up into our neck of the woods, and that's keeping us high and dry. It's going to be the dominant factor. It's not going to be directly overhead, but it's still going to be close enough to influence us over the next 7 to 10 days. So the rainfall gets deflected all around us and we don't cash in on any of the much needed rain. Tomorrow, the morning fog, then afternoon sun, 46 at 7 a.m., 76 by 4 p.m. in a south southeasterly wind at 5 to 15. There's actually a cold front that hits on Thursday, but all it does is make give us some slightly cooler mornings. We're not back down in the 30s or anything. All right. Thank you, Adam. Leap babies and ice class up next in the bus. <laughs> To the buzz and an Oklahoma woman about to turn 100 years old, but it's really only her 25th birthday. I think we did a case that explains on this. We sure did. Yeah, Mary Forsyth was born on February 29th, 1924, Leap Day. Since leap years only come around every four years, she will technically celebrate her 25th birthday this year. And a lot of people do that. They yeah. have their bar and bat mitzvahs, their quinceaneras again as adults. The party got started a little bit early with this community gathering. During non-leap years, people like Mary usually celebrate their birthday on either February 28th or March 1st, sometimes both days. History.com reports only about 5 million people worldwide have a leap day birthday. Mary looks great Yeah, for 100 or 25 or whatever she <laughs> Whichever is. Whichever one she wants yeah. to be this year. His guitar will no longer weep, gently or otherwise. Paul McCartney has been reunited with a bass guitar that was stolen more than 50 years ago. The Hofner bass was used on the Beatles' first two albums, which included hits like Twist and Shout and Love Me Do. A Hofner executive launched a search for it in 2018 and determined it was stolen in 1972 from the back of a van in London. It turns out the son of the man who stole the guitar came forward with more information. Apparently, the man didn't know the guitar he stole belonged to McCartney. Then the family who had it sent pictures asking if what they had was the stolen bass. The guitar slightly damaged, but will be able to be fully restored. Pretty cool. It's good news. All right, first grade can be really tough in Sweden. For a group of students, it includes jumping into the icy water of a frozen over lake. I don't think they're jumping. They're more like being dropped. Well, they're yeah, being forced to jump. Yeah, the fully clothed ice bath is part of their official curriculum. It's called survival training in Sweden. Could you imagine this happening in the US? This has a real world application though in Sweden because accidents keep happening where people fall through the ice while skating or ice fishing. One important skill these students will learn in this training is how to use ice spikes to pull themselves out of the water. All right, some of them were jumping. Wow. But we got Caskey's attention. Yeah. Mr. Minnesota with we an ice ice fishing story. So, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll be right back. <laughs> That is all our time on the News at 6. Thanks so much for watching. See you on the Night Beat at 10.